was lucky, my wife was an angel. I met her when I was 15, when my mum died, and, and she took me, and she, she brought me up virtually. She became the parent, let alone my girlfriend, and then to be wife. And on the back of her, we had three beautiful kids, you know, and uh, I became successful. She was really driven, I was really driven. But it was always her talking me along, if I want the honest truth. And if you want the honest truth, it was always her. And um, I would be able to work like no other man would work. And then just, it would just, it just come into my head, I'll just have a drink, I can take one drink, you know. And uh, I'd take that one drink and it would take me straight away. I, I would go missing for days. Two or three days I would go missing and, uh, you know, I would then be left with guilt, shame and all the things I was doing and, and then I'd graft again to make it up for us. So very quickly, we had the best of everything through my always continually reconciling with my wife and my family. But I didn't, what I didn't realise was that obviously the, the illness was progressing and, uh, the, binge, the binges and the, the gaps between the work and the drink and the work and the drink were getting shorter and, and the consequences were getting a lot worse. The economy crashed a few years back and I went from only 70 properties. I had a farm in Warwick, 20 acres of land. My friends called me the Earl of Warwick by this time and uh, what nobody realised was I was sitting in a stairwell in that house on my own trying to drink myself to death. I couldn't cope, I could no longer cope with the stress. I could no longer cope with trying to hold everything together. And um, I was drinking to die. I ended up in uh, on the streets in Birmingham. Um, I'd got nowhere to go. My family, my pride wouldn't let me go back to my family. Um, and I ended up in a place where I never thought I'd end up, I ended up sleeping. Sleeping out, sleeping rough. I'd be lying there, fully dressed, in a sleeping bag, just hoping not to wake up in the end. I was wishing for the end, I wanted to die. That's basically where I ended up. My ex-wife had been in touch with Changes, I didn't realise, and they phoned me. Changes actually phoned me, I never thought they would. They phoned me and made an appointment for me to come in. And uh, I, I went, cut a long story short, I went. And I met this chap, and he was just like me. He talked like me. He had obviously worked like me. He'd used like me. He was he was just me in a different shirt and trousers, if you want the honest truth. And uh, because of his language, I talked to him straight away because I, it takes a long time for me to trust anybody. And when you get that low, you can't even trust yourself, let alone another human being. And I trusted him. I trusted him straight away. And um, I can remember leaving after my initial interview with a bit of hope, hope that I hadn't had for years because I was hopeless. And I left the building with hope, you know, and uh, he told me that it'd be a few days and uh, not, to, not to use or drink or, and I'd have a chance. To his word, I came back for the second interview and he told me we would do an assessment and I was nervous, you know, what if I get turned away? And I walked in the door, big steel door at the front, and uh, full of fear. Is it, good, is it gonna work? And there was a chap on the steps called uh, Hayden. I'd never met the man in my life. And he bombed down these steps and he threw his arms around me. And that was priceless, that hook. And he, you know, I did the assessment, and, and I'll, I'll cut a long story short. I cut in, and uh, I had to let go of it completely. The first thing I asked for was the phone. That phone, I thought, was my lifeline. Really, it was something that was keeping me in the madness, keeping me out there. They asked me for the phone, so I'd, I was willing to go to any lengths at long last, and I was willing to let go of the reins and let other people look after me. And that mad obsession and compulsion to drink and 
get out of my face and escape and to run, it, it, it dispersed quite quickly. And uh, I found by giving myself in the groups and taking part 100%, other people were getting help as well. People in the groups, uh, every day in, a, in changes became like a school day again. I got humble, I became teachable, willing, all them things that I'd heard for years and thought would never happen to me. And uh, the people I met in there, service users as well as the people, volunteers, everybody, it's been an amazing journey. And uh, I would look at everyone in here like my new family. And when I see them in meetings and places where we, we have to go to, and I see people who use the service come out the other end and still doing well, that's what gives me hope on a daily basis. And um, my biggest regret is not finding it 25 years ago. Would I have been ready? I don't know, but you know, I've got hope. There's a way of life now. I wouldn't go back to my old way of life. If there wasn't a life there, that's, the, that's something else I've learned. There's an exciting life ahead of me now, where I can, I can, I don't need all that stuff. I don't need any of that. All I need is what they're giving me inside. And that putting my head on a pillar and sleeping, that feeling safe, there ain't enough money anyway that could buy that. And uh, I'm grateful. And as you know, I am really grateful. And there's not much more I could say. <laughs>